We want to remember that when God gave or breathed life into Adam, that was a miracle. Life is a miracle. Birth is a miracle. And uh, therefore, under the definition of miracle in the American Dictionary of the English Language, uh, Noah Webster's 1828, defines miracle as this. In theology, an event or effect contrary to the established constitution and course of things, or a deviation from the known laws of nature, a supernatural event. Interestingly, if you've ever received any communication from the departments that register births, deaths, and marriages, they will state clearly that they register events. Well, they're actually registering a supernatural event because life is a supernatural event. Now, in the understanding of insurance law, there are things that will actually discharge the parties from contract. So upon your birth, even though your parents may have been participating in an insurance contract, your birth was a miracle. And according to the laws of, that govern this, this is it's called the, Act of God Clause, also known as Force Majeure. This is from the Dictionary of Canadian Law now. That's right. The Dictionary of Canadian Law defines Act of God Clause. So just consider that your Christian name that occurred on the birth record that gets an A.D. coverage on the document because A.D. only stands for in the year of our Lord and Savior, which is dealing with God and Christ, the superior uh, jurisdiction, states under Act of God clause, generally operates to discharge a contracting party when a supervening, sometimes supernatural event beyond the control of either party makes performance impossible. The common thread is that the unexpected, something beyond reasonable human foresight and skill. So just consider that a lightning effect happened on this document when your Christian name came in. And because the surname is actually in law contrary, opposite to your God-given name, your proper name, your Christian name, it kills the contractor, blots it out. Now, if we read into Colossians, that will make it actually much more understandable because Colossians, which this is a scripture that's had a lot of controversy. Some are believing that... that uh, Colossians talking about God canceling or Christ canceling out the Ten Commandments. Well, well, then I guess it would be okay to go out and kill. It would be okay to go out and steal then. Because if it canceled that out, well, then why did God give them? So God telling us in other scriptures that we were to obey all his commandments. We have to read the scriptures in the overall to understand what's going on. We can't just isolate for an idea of focus convenience because a pastor or a minister may say that. It's up to you to do your due diligence, not to be spoon-fed from a pulpit. The early Christians were examining the scriptures daily. They weren't listening to a pastor who said that's the way it is without you being responsible to do your own due diligence to verify that. So because someone has put it in their doctrine to teach something that's contrary to the scripture doesn't mean you're supposed to believe it. And therefore it'd be contrary to even just logic uh, to believe that God canceled out ten commandments that he gave because none of those commandments were there to harm man. They were there to keep him in peace and in good faith. So in the book of Colossians, Bear with me here, I didn't have it marked. So I'm going to Colossians. Colossians 2, starting at 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, 
which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Well, interestingly, when you look into the actual writings at that time, even the wording there about the ordinances, um, it was mainly dealing with statute law of man. It said primarily it meant statute law of man, not to do with God. God doesn't write laws that he needs to cancel. That would imply the fact is that his laws are actually contrary to man. There are, there are laws, thou shalt not kill, contrary, or thou shalt not murder, contrary to, to man. Should man then be killing one another then? Nope. Uh, thou shalt not steal, that would be contrary to man? No, that's a blessing to not do that therefore there's certainly we have to look at what's going on here but interestingly when you look at what's happening there i can tell you that the surname by its mere representation of what it stands for representing a heathen or a gentile someone without a covenant with the true god even according to the earlier dictionaries certainly that would be contrary to our christian jurisdiction can you have a believer on one side and an unbeliever on the other side? Wouldn't that be bipolar? It'd be like putting truth and fiction together and saying you can have the two be there. God is not a God of confusion, according to Scripture. So he doesn't merge truth and evil, though man will do that. Satan will do that. Satan merged by his first lie, telling man or telling Eve that she would not die for doing something that God said would cause death. By chance that we have the two together merged all over the world, worldwide program that we call the sin program. <laughs> and by putting two things together that would be illegal, not lawful and to do it you need a license to break the law so everything you do you need to sign and guarantor for because there's no one to back it up other than you for your sin you know you could not be surety for another without smarting for it and we even send our children to public school to get smart don't forget the series get smart dealing with chaos and control because we didn't see these things, because we didn't see the perjury of our lying, saying something that we are not, by identifying ourselves as a fiction, a lie, and then thinking that it's not going to work contrary to us, by identifying ourselves not clearly as a Christian, how more simple could it be a Christian name? A proper name. That's where the property is, not in the surname. That's just a debtor's name who doesn't understand where his promised position is through the seed of Abraham. Did Abraham have a surname? No. Did Isaac have a surname? Did Jacob have a surname? Did Noah have a surname? No, surname is the law name and there was no promise under the law. It was all by faith. So... Our concern right now is, are we reading the scriptures to really get the answers? Do we see that the gospel is a good spell? Do you have a bad spell in your name? Well, if you keep the bad spell in your name, you will have a bad spell because you will have a time limit on the use of that bad spell because that's only here for a time. And those that run secular government are called democracy. And they put a time and a date trying to court and date you every time you take something that you should not be touching that is unclean. Touch what is unclean, and Gentiles were considered unclean. Surprisingly, the world now seems to be inundated with the idea of film. And film comes from foreskin. And the Gentiles had a foreskin, and the whole thing was about you having a circumcision of the heart. And therefore, you would be separate from the world of unbelievers. And Gentiles were considered unbelievers without a covenant with the true God. So you can't use an unbeliever identification mark and say that you're a believer. 
Because that would be identifying yourself as an enemy of God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, social has to do with friendship. Could you be involved in an aggregate of anybody can be in the social insurance program? You could be of any faith, any belief, do anything you want and be a social insurance registrant in an aggregate. Now, if I'm in that aggregate, then I certainly couldn't be separate from the world. Because I voluntarily have placed myself in a program with a mass. It is impossible to be separate if you're in an aggregate. And if you're identified by something that marks you in the ag aggregate as a beast, which most of the surnames represent, clearly you're identifying yourself as an animal. And you are now a human resource, a colorable man, colorable title. Not a man, a human. Human is not used in the King James Bible. So why is everybody using the term human? And we know it's related in other definitions as actually being a monster, an abomination. And abominations could not inherit property. Your grace position is clearly there, but if you do not see it, you will not be able to go forward. The yes, this requires faith to walk in a direction that you will require your faith to go forward with. You do not require faith to go down the occupation journey. 